A hundred years ago, a significant number of missionaries, or global workers as we call them now, were called one-way missionaries. One-way missionaries. And the reason they were called one-way missionaries is not because Jesus is the one way, the truth and the life. They were called one-way missionaries because when they bought their, their ticket for the boat to the country they were going to, they didn't buy return tickets. They only bought tickets one way. And the reality is when they were leaving North America, leaving home, none of them expected to ever see their family again. The commitment to being a missionary, the commitment to being a global worker was, was one way. On the screen is a picture of A.W. Milne. A.W. Milne, a little over a century ago, felt the call of God to the Hebrides Islands in the South Pacific. And as he prayed and thought, he purchased a, a one-way ticket. And he stood at the train station and said goodbye to his family, his parents, his siblings, he just had one suitcase full of all of his earthly belongings. He got on the train to get on the boat and just had a one-way ticket. In his case, though, it was a very real expectation that he would never get home again. You see, every missionary, every global worker up to that point, up to that time that had ever gone to the Hebrides Islands, every one of them had died for their faith, had been killed by the tribe in Hebrides. Somehow, by the favor and the grace of God and the plan and purposes of God, However, A.W. Milne won the favor of the people in the Hebrides Island. And he labored there for 35 years. And he died on the island. When he died on the island, the tribal leaders took his body and buried it in the middle of the village. And this is the epitaph they put on his tombstone. When he came here, there was no light. When he left here, there was no darkness. When he came here, there was no light. When he left here, there was no darkness. A certain radicalness to some believers and to some Christians. This understanding that their life was not their own. And the only thing that really matters once you become a Christian is giving your all, pouring yourself out completely, totally, without reservation to him. One question asked over and over again, what do you want, Jesus? We read about that in Romans chapter 6. I invite you to find your Bibles or look it up on your phone or or follow us along on the PowerPoint. Romans chapter 6, beginning at verse 1. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? May it never be. How shall we who died to sin still live in it? Or how do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Christ Jesus have been baptized into his death? 
Therefore, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, so we too might walk in newness of life. For if we become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self was crucified with him, in order that our body of sin might be done away with, so that we would no longer be slaves to sin, for he who has died is freed from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him, knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead, is never to die again. Death no longer is master over him, for the death that he died, he died to sin once for all, but... The life that he lives, he lives to God. Even so, consider yourself to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Christians, people like A.W. Milne, seem to live differently than many of us. They'll go where God calls them without even thinking twice about whether they'll ever see home again. They do not fear death because they understand they've already died. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, but I, I, I've already died, so why fear death? I'm dead. Paul is touching on that theme here in Romans chapter 6. Very interesting verse in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3. Do you not know that all of us who've been baptized into Jesus Christ have been baptized into his death? People who were baptized today. And it's interesting, and I think it's fundamental, I think it's essentially important that we understand this. That early in our Christian journey, early in our walk with God, God says, go get baptized. The Greek word is baptizo. I love that word. I love saying it, baptizo. Isn't that neat? Baptizo. Baptizo. The Greek word is baptizo. They were baptizoed today. Interesting word. It means two things. First of all, it means immersion. If, uh, and I had to work a little bit on you, Carrie, but um, if when you're being baptized, only... 15 sixteenths of you gets under the water, you haven't really yet been baptized. <laughs> it's all. It's a total immersion. All of you dead. All of you. You can't save part of me and say, God, you've got all of those sections, but I'm keeping a hold of that part. It's an immersion. It's, it's a total surrender. It's a total baptizo of everything. So it's immersion, but it's it's more than just immersion. It's an immersion that changes everything. In the recipes that we have, uh, really the only time the word baptizo is used in secular literature, it's in a recipe. And in that recipe, uh, the word baptizo talks about what happens to a cucumber when it is, turns into a pickle. The, the Pickle is different than the cucumber. The cucumber's been totally... So it's not just about getting immersed, getting in there for half a second, getting out, whoo, come out of here before anything changes too much. It's an immersion that changes everything. It, it's an immersion that calls us to be all in to something different. New Testament, the doctrine and the teaching of baptizo uh, is, is really big and really consistent through the writings of of the epistles and the, the call of Jesus. The first baptizo is a baptizo in, in water. We witnessed it this morning. You go into the water and you are immersed in it. 
I'm not going to read the text. You can trust me this morning or be a good student of Scripture and write it down and see if I made them up later. The second is a, a baptizo into the body of Christ. When you become a Christian, friends, you get into this immersed thing. Get into this immersed thing. More happens than all of a sudden your sins are forgiven and you don't feel guilty anymore. More happens than you've got this insurance policy you carry around in your wallet uh, that says you're going to heaven and you're not going to hell. Thank you, Jesus. More happens than you get up on the weekend at some point and you come sit in straight rows and sing songs about Jesus. When you become a Christian, you become immersed. You get all into the body of Christ. This church thing is not something you dip into and experience for an hour or an hour and a half a week. It, it, it's all in. Immersed in the body of Christ. And then the third baptizo is the baptizo, the baptism in the Holy Spirit. Those of us, and I'm one of them, who call ourselves Pentecostals or full gospel people, charismatic people, spirit-filled people, uh, we tend to get a little sidetracked on the baptism of the Holy Spirit and, and think that bapt being baptized in the Holy Spirit is all about speaking in tongues. And we miss the significance of the baptism in the Holy Spirit. The baptism in the Holy Spirit is this immersion in the Holy Spirit. We live in the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is under us and beside us and over us. We live, we move, we breathe Holy Spirit. Uh, that's why Scripture says we walk in the Holy Spirit. We don't visit the Holy Spirit. We don't ask for some precious moment in God's presence. We are immersed in Him. We live in Him. We walk in Him. So the Christian life is, is a huge change. It's a, it's a baptizo. A baptizo that calls for us to be all in. Totally immersed in the life of Christ. When I uh, went to Bible college, I moved in with my paternal grandfather, my dad's dad. My grandmother had already passed away, and so it was grandpa and I in the house. And I'd come home at the end of the day and I'd have some wonderful, wonderful conversations with this, this great man of God. And I said to Grandpa Emil one day of one of those conversations, Grandpa, why did you leave the Soviet Union in the mid-1920s to come to Canada? And he said... John, it really wasn't about the fact that there didn't seem to be much food around anymore. It, it really wasn't uh, about the state of the economy. The reason I left the Soviet Union is the Bolsheviks weren't letting us go to church anymore. They were not allowing us to worship God and talk about Jesus. And I didn't want my kids to grow up in a, in a country where their lives wouldn't be immersed in Jesus and the ways of God. So I... I paid the price to get to Canada. So different than so many of the stories I've seen as a 
leader in the local church in the last 40 years. More than once it's happened to me that, that a man or a woman has talked to me in the foyer or said, made an appointment to come in and talk in the office for a wee bit and the story would go something like this. Pastor, we've loved our church, but I got a bit of a promotion to such and such a province or such and such a city, and we'll be making $15,000 more, and we've just decided we're going to take the promotion. And they leave a church... And they leave a community where their kids were thriving in their relationship with God. And they come back and see me six years later, and this is the story. They say, Pastor, we never should have left. We made some more money, but we lost our kids. We're so often not immersed. <laughs> And the things of God, his passions aren't pa our passions. What, what, what's going to advance the kingdom of God in our homes? What's going to be best for the things of God? We, we don't factor that in. We just do what we want to do so we'll have more things, more stuff. But the Christian experience is... Uh, an immersion experience. It's, a, it, it's, it's all in. This is what we live and breathe now. The ways of God, the things of God. My grandfather was given a homestead by the Canadian government when he arrived in Canada. It was uh, about 85 miles northeast of Edmonton. Nobody had ever been up there before. He had to buy a really good axe, and he literally chopped the trees down to make a pathway for the cow he had and the couple of horses and the buggy with some of their stuff on it so they could get to the land that was his. That exact path is now the Athabasca Highway. So he plows through this land to get to the homestead to build a, a house. I have in my office at the district a picture of that log cabin. It was just logs, window, a couple of doors. Very rudimentary life. They were rich. They were rich in the Soviet Union. <laughs> they lived well. And the nearest church was eight miles away in a little town called Newbrook. Grandpa helped build it. And every Saturday, my dad tells me in the winter, Grandpa had a big stone, a big rock. And he'd take the big stone... <laughs> and he'd put it in the oven in their wood-burning stove. And he'd keep the wood burning real hot till Sunday morning. He would somehow take the stone out of the oven and he'd put it in the back of the buggy so the six kids could sit around the stone and stay warm on the way to church in the middle of a cold northern Alberta winter. And now, in a day in which we just have to go out, some of us don't even have to go out, we just have to hit lock and pop, pop, and the trucker car starts. Now, in a day in which we can preheat our vehicles and drive in warmth to church on Friday, if we hear, oh, it's snowing Sunday, hon, I don't think we can go to church. What's happened to us? This life we live, friends, is, is immersed in him, immersed in the body of Christ. We live and breathe him. We live and breathe this stuff. What's happened to us? Well, 
We, we make commitments. Yeah, pastor, I'll be there. You can count on me. But when we're saying it in the back of our mind, we're saying, yeah, I'll be there. You can count on me. But in the back of my mind, we're saying, if nothing better comes up. And for some of us, the nothing better is microphone, microwave, sorry, microwave popcorn while you watch The Bachelor. God help us. We're different. We're different. We're called out of... Adam into Christ. We're called out of darkness into light. We get get totally immersed in him and in, in his ways. Every church has two basic groups in it. There's all kinds of things that make us different, and I could choose another two things we'd differ on, but every church basically has two groups of people in it. Sometimes it's 50-50. I think more often it's 70-30 or 80-20 or 90-10, but almost every church has two groups in it. One group believes that, well, they used to be dead in sin. Now they're, they're saved from sin. And there's this understanding that when they move from being in Adam to in Christ, that that calling is a calling out of sin and into Jesus and we all sin, we all fall short of God's glory, even after we're Christians. But there's, there's this direction in our lives where we, we hate sin and we hate, we hate doing things that dishonors God and it grieves our soul and it causes us to weep in our prayer times. We know we're called out of darkness into light. We're called away from sin and into Christ's righteousness. There's this understanding in our hearts, that when we become a believer, when we become a Christian, we're saved from sin. And then there's another group in the church that sees it a little differently. And they think the big thing that happened when they became a Christian is their saved from the punishment of sin. And the big thing they rejoice about after they accept Jesus is, hallelujah, I'm not going to hell. I'm heaven bound. And that's what their whole faith is built on. I'm heaven bound. I'm not going to burn anymore. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, wonderful, wonderful. wonderful. I'm not going to burn but there's no sense of not only being saved from the punishment of sin, but God wants to deliver us and set us free from the presence of sin so we can live in freedom and liberty. And so we read Romans 6 in the context of Romans 5 and the last verse of Romans chapter 5 says that as sin reigned in death, even so grace would reign through righteousness to eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we understand that while we used to be in a place where sin reigned in death, sometimes we think sin is pretty hot stuff, but sin does none of us any good. Sin always brings death. Sin reigns in death. But now we've been transferred to the kingdom of Christ. We're in Christ, that place where through grace, righteousness reigns to eternal life. It's a big change. 
There are some people who don't get that the call to Christ is also a call to righteousness. And because of that, Paul has to write this in the next verse. What shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin so that grace may increase? Hallelujah! I'm not going to be punished anymore. I'm not going to hell. I'm going to heaven, but in the meantime, I'm sure going to enjoy it down here. Grace abounds. And Paul's response to that is King James Version, God forbid, the New American Standard Version, which I read earlier in the service. May it never be. May it never be. Thank God, yes, friends, we are saved from the punishment of sin. But don't hang all your hat there. We're saved from sin. We're saved from sin. So interesting verse, and I'm winding down now, which means absolutely nothing. Uh, (laughs) 2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 16 to 18. What agreement has the temple of God with idols? We're the temple of the living God. Just as God said, I'll dwell in them and walk among them. I'll be their God. They shall be my people. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate, says the Lord. And do not touch what is unclean. I'll welcome you. I'll be a father to you. And you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord. Wonderful, wonderful promises in these three verses. I'll dwell among them, dwell in them. Do you know that Jesus is in you? Do you know that? Yes. Jesus is in you. I'll dwell in them, walk among them. I'll be their God. They'll be my people. I will be at the end of here. I'll be a father to you, and you shall be sons and daughters to me, says the Lord Almighty. Wow. Great promises. But there's a therefore in there. Therefore, come out from their midst and be separate. Therefore, do not touch what is unclean. There's a calling from darkness into light. We get totally immersed in the things of God. We get totally immersed in the ways of God. We're all in. We live and breathe it. So the next verse, again, we jump the chapter. We read this, 2 Corinthians 7, verse 1. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all defilement of flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. I try not to use big words when I preach, mostly because I don't know very many. And secondly, because the ones I know, I don't know how to pronounce. But let me throw a couple of, they're not real long, but they're not used very often, theological terms. Theologians are monogists or synergists. And the monogists believe that uh, our spiritual walk It's all about God and everything God does. Anything that needs to be done, God's going to do it for us. We just need to lay down and let him work. Because it starts with him, it ends with him, and he's going to do everything to get us where we need to be. And the sinner just say, well, certainly it starts with God, and certainly God's at work. But there's synergy between us and him. We have to cooperate. We have to do our part. Now, I'm a synergist who leans a bit towards monogist, being a monogist, but I am a synergist. The longer I live for God, the more I realize the good things that have happened in my life is because God took over. But we do have to cooperate here. And I ask you to read that yellow rectangle. Who does the cleansing? Uh, 
Now, God cleanses our sins from all unrighteousness, and thanks be to God. But what do we do? We also cleanse ourselves, and then Christians read that and they say, oh, that's a contradiction. But if you've been hanging out here, you know that I have a firm conviction about this rubber band. And the truth is in the tension. And yes, God does forgive all of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. But you got floppy theology, if that's all you believe. And you got a works theology, if you, all you believe is, man, i got to cleanse myself from all filthiness of the flesh. The truth is in the synergy. The truth is in the tension. And so we need to take seriously our responsibility. This portion, end of Romans 5, Romans 6, is really some teaching about that thing called sanctification we talked about yesterday. So Paul asks the question in Romans 6, verse 1, shall we, shall we continue in sin? The answer is God forbid. And now I take you to the verse I ended with last week. Worship band, uh, I don't know if I asked you to come along now, but come along even if it's not on the worship schedule. Find something to sing that we sang earlier. But Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Boy, we got sharp deacons around here. They know there's something else that needs to be done. Thank you, Colin and Tim. Consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Anybody got the amplified version with them this morning or can look it up quickly on their phone? First person to come stand beside me gets to read it. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. So Saturday church last night, beautiful service. I ended the service by inviting everybody to just form little groups of three or four or five and pray together that God would help us to live that out. And after we'd prayed it, I prayed together, I, I dismissed the service and I'm three quarters of the way down the aisle and uh, one of the groups says, stop here while we were praying. This girl just gave her life to Jesus. She began to consider herself dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. Let me get the mic so everybody can hear you. What's it say there? Come on up. Verse number 11, amplified version. Yep. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and your relation to to it broken, but alive to God in unbroken fellowship with him in Jesus Christ. Read that again. I love it. I love it. I love it. Read it again. Everybody listen. Even so, consider yourselves to be dead to sin and your relation to it broken, but alive to God in unbroken fellowship with him in Christ Jesus. Thank you. When you get up in the morning, I said last night, what do you do when you get up in the morning? It was just the introduction to uh, what I wanted to add to the message. Our oldest son, Evan, had the microphone because he'd been wandering around the sanctuary asking people questions. And he answered, he said, I brushed my teeth. And then I said, well, do you do anything else? He says, I take a shower. Well, all those things are good. Keep doing them, friends. <laughs> but, but I want to add, I want to add something to your morning routine. We need to get up in the morning and we need to reckon, we need to consider ourselves dead to sin and alive to God, totally immersed in Him. That's why I'm going to live this day, Lord. I'm not going to I'm not going to let sin have life. I'm going to live in the life of God today. It needs to be a part of our, our mornings, our routines, how we live. So brush your teeth. 
keep taking your showers. But sometime before you start your day, make this reckoning, make this consideration, oh God, I reckon myself today <laughs> dead to sin. And I consider myself alive to you. And everything I do today is going to be centered around you. I am all in. I'm all in, Lord.